Welcome to the Yale Center for British Arts online series, At Home, Artists in Conversation. I'm Courtney J. Martin, the Center's Director, and I'm delighted to welcome Anthony McCall to our program tonight. Please note that this program will be recorded. Your camera and sound are muted and will remain so throughout. We'll be using the Q&A feature located on your navigation bar to gather your questions, which will be answered at the conclusion of the program. Anthony McCall was born in Britain, but has lived and worked in New York since 1973. He is most well known for his solid light works, a series that he began in 73 with line describing a cone in which a volumetric form composed of projected light slowly evolves into three dimensions. This work was most recently explored in the 2017 exhibition of the same name at KW Institute for Contemporary Art in Berlin. Anthony's practice occupies the physical and conceptual space between sculpture, cinema, and drawing, which has been recognized in a number of important exhibitions, such as the Whitney Museum of American Arts 2001 Landmark, Into the Light, The Projected Image in American Art 1964 to 1977, and The Cinema Effect, Illusion, Reality, and the Projected Image, which was on view at the Hirshhorn in 2008. In that same year, he was awarded a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship, which was followed by recognition from the American Academy in Berlin in 2014 and the American Academy of Arts and Letters in 2015. His most recent solo exhibition, Dark Room Solid Light, was on view at the Albright Knox Art Gallery in Buffalo last year. Anthony, I first became aware of your work via the 1972 film, Landscape for Fire. Could we start tonight's conversation by watching an excerpt from it? Oh, yeah. This was one of the um, my early film performances that was uh, uh, with using fire in landscape. There were actually about seven of them between seventy two and seventy four, and it was uh, this was my attempt to document one of them. Of course, the film could never really replace a live event, um, but I began to, I began to consider the possibility of a film that would be a live performance in its own right. Uh, and um, here's what here's what I uh, discovered. Imagine this being the screen of, of a, a screen of a movie, and there's a white line which very slowly over a thirty minute period <clears throat> describes a, com a circle. The end of thirty minutes is a complete circle. Um, but actually, you're invited to look in the opposite direction, not at the screen, but back to the projector. And there you see that that curved line on the screen describes a curved, a curving conical form in three dimensional space, which you can move around and explore very much like you would sculpture. Is this, Anthony, I'm wondering, I'm wondering what does, where does this come from for you? Were you, had you trained in film? I know that you had gone to um, what was then the Ravensbourne College of Art. Um, yep. And this, your school at the time um, had recently sort of um, brought in two different schools, Bromley College of Art, and then also um, the furniture department from uh, Beckingham School of Art. Right. And I just wonder if there was a, was there a film program? Did you, did you there, come? There and was a film, there was a film and television program, though I was not part of it, though many of my friends were. I studied graphic design which was actually, in retrospect, was a very good decision because it meant that I learned photography, typography, and things like that. Um, 
uh, and uh, the painting department was, wasn't really, uh, wouldn't have um, suited me at all. So I, became, but I, as an artist, I'm self-taught and certainly as a filmmaker, I um, secured the help of friends to make Landscape for Fire, which was my very first film. And so what happens um, after you come to New York in 73? I, I think that line describing a cone, was this not a work that you had at least conceptualized before you moved to New York while you were still living in the UK? That's correct. I, I, and, I, and I made it, I arrived in January 1973 and I made it in August. Wow. So it was, was my first work. And this photograph actually was, it was um, the first American showing. That was 1974. And it was in the newly, quite new, recently formed artist space at 155 Worcester Street. And what did you call this work? At the time? Describing a Kern. But as a, as, a, as a product, how did you describe it? Did you call it, was this a film work? Was this... Um, oh. Yes, you will always attach the word work to almost anything in those days. <laughs> um, I, well, I referred to them as solid light films and I continued to use the word film for quite a long time, even after it was no longer the medium I was working with. Um, but it was a convenient term that just described something like a work, you know. And, uh, but I also felt myself to be part, I mean, to be connected in some way to conceptual art. Okay. And I'd never thought of myself actually as a filmmaker. And um, so the choice of medium was really a question of what seemed appropriate. That seems to be true of many people um, who were working in what I might describe as ex expanded cinema at that moment. Um, Michael Snow, Stan Brackage, Paul Sheritz. Um, well, you, all seem, yeah. Yeah, you all seem on some level not fully comfortable with calling yourselves filmmakers. No, that's right. Um, Yes, and there were also other descriptions going on. There was new American cinema, there was expanded cinema, um, structural film. There were many uh, labels for these kinds of experiments in uh, using media. Okay. Shall I continue with on to the next one? Um, yes, please. Uh, Courtney. Um, so the next film was made, uh, you know, a year after Line Describing a Cone, I made this one, long film for four projectors. And I'd been intrigued I've been interested in, in, in um, uh, breaking up the rules that produced a live audience assembled to watch something once through, quote unquote. And um, so in this case, I had four blades of light were sent into the room and separate, uh, built the room out into, um, into a field of moving planes of light a field that you could only leave by leaving the room. So in a way, the space to find the, the uh, design of the film is a, a, um, a view of it in installation. So this was made of, a, a, it was made, built out of permutation, the permutation of four speeds of movement of that plane of light, one second, four seconds, 16, 64, and four modulations of light, mm -hmm. uh, solid, glimmering, flickering, and blinking. And um, uh, the exhaustion of the permutation uh, produced a work that was, had a cycle of five and a half hours, which was pleasing to me because what that meant was that instead of an audience arriving, assembling themselves at one moment to watch something once through, you had, you had visitors coming and going on their own time. A very, very familiar form now, which is, I suppose, installation, but at the time, uh, unusual for these kinds of media. And, and how long do you think it took for audiences, um, your visitors, to become comfortable with that expectation? Uh, you know, I, I think there were varying levels of difficulty. Uh, I, long film for four projectors, was, for me, was quite hard to watch. I wasn't sure how you were meant to do it because there was no central focus. So, so but I mean, I found those difficulties interesting. Um, the thing is, I was successful in, in, in creating an individual visitor, which which, which is what uh, I was aiming for. And here I have a little clip of one, one movement of one projector uh, through the frame. And this particular movement is um, 16 seconds long and the light modulation I would describe as, as flickering. Um, 
Now we're going to jump to, uh, nearly 25 years <clears throat> to when I, uh, I began to pick up the solid light form again. I had finished, I, at the end of the 70s, I decided that I'd completed a series. There were seven films and uh, I felt that I had reached a certain good point. Uh, I had no idea the gap would be quite so long. But when I started again, I, um, I, I discovered this form I hadn't used before, which was a, a, a wave, or in fact, as I called it, a traveling wave, uh, in which um, um, a, a plane of light, a traveling wave would pass through the frame. And in the piece I developed, which is called Doubling Back, the, the traveling wave would, one would go horizontally, the other vertically, the green form vertically going upwards. The result of that, those two waves moving against one another was to produce these interesting pockets of space, which you can see below. The other important thing about doubling back was that I pl placed the projector in the corner of the room, uh, such that it also projected along the side wall. So much of the spatial, the creation of spaces was enacted by the, um, the unfurling membranes of light, which unfurled against the wall. And so you can see that as a sort of tunnel uh, space that can be walked into. Um, let's see if I can point it out. You see, this is, this is, um, this is a space. These spaces are constantly mutating, as you can see from following the storyboard, which is every three minutes. And here it is in installation. This was at, um, uh, Lugano Art and Culture, which is a museum in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And um, you get some sense of the uh, uh, physical space and the, um, and you just have to imagine that although you can't see the forms, you can't really catch them moving exactly, but over a few minutes, the uh, spatial forms uh, transform themselves repeatedly. I have read Anthony that you, um, you describe uh, one of the conditions, one of the primary conditions of, of your work in this manner is being um, reliant upon the dark. Yeah, absolutely right. It's perhaps the most important thing to say is that these take place in the dark. The most obvious thing, but it's very rarely do. Uh, take place in the dark, so that's a necessary precondition. The other is that there is a, there is a, a thing called a haze machine in the room, which produces a kind of a thin mist, like a sea mist in the room which is caught by the uh, particles of light. And, 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 and so it reveals these planes of light. Without the haze machine, you would only see the image on the wall. Now, this is a beginning of a few images about you and I horizontal, um, which was made in 2005. Um, and what's going on here is there's a man looking, uh, he has his back to the screen, we, if you like, of the screen, and he's looking into the projector. And there are, there's a complex form he's inside. One is that there are, there's a curving plane. This is a curving plane. You can't read this uh, two-dimensional drawing very well, but you have a curving plane there, and then you have a rather complicated arrangement of straight lines and traveling waves over here. And as, as he watches and moves around, what happens is that there is a, a continuous mutation going on in the form. And it's irregular enough that you can't quite identify what it is. Mm. Um, but if you, if you look in the other direction, which we'll come to in a moment, you'll see that the line drawing on the wall is, is very explicable. Um, at any rate, for me, what was interesting about this is only one second, but it occurred to me that um, it could be much longer, so much longer, in fact, that it would be the whole film. So I, was, um, I began building a seven and a half minute wipe. I was building it with these forms. We had um, a white brings together two shots, right, traditionally. So our shot one, if you like, was this um, ellipse. And our shot two was what would be a traveling wave. It can't quite see the curve yet, uh, bisected by a straight line. Now these, in a wipe, what the moving images, are, the constituent moving images are doing continue. So they're all in motion. Meanwhile, the wipe, uh, connects them and separates them. So you have the wipe is this invisible edge joining up these ends, and you won't see that. But now we'll look at it 
the animation at the speed at which I made made it in your and I horizontal. Right, the animation is now running. So the one on the left is advancing and the forms on the right are, are disappearing. Anthony, is this happening slowly or is my sense of it happening in a different speed at which I expect it because I'm watching it intently? It, it's, it's happening at exactly the speed it would be in, in the film. Um, and the reason it is slow, and it, s slowness has become a value for me since I discovered something important about speed. Uh, when you're making sculpture, which is animated, if you like, when making a kind of sculpture which is in motion, um, which is if you make it go too fast, then what a visitor will do will be to stock, uh, stock still in their tracks and wait and watch something to do with high motion, fast motion of things in the real world uh, makes us do that. And um, whereas if I made the motion much slower, uh, I found that uh, the visitor would feel perfectly comfortable exploring it as if it were not moving at all. And um, so since these are looked at as if they're sculpture, it was very important not to thwart that business of being free to feeling free to move around, walk through in, through and around. And so the slowness I developed by trial and error, really, as a necessary condition of these works. Does, does that make this the sense that you now have? Um, you have a time space elapse, you have a sense of you have a kind of corporeal sense, like as the as the visitor, I have to adjust my body to not only the speed at which um, you know, light is moving around me, but also my understanding, my comfort really with the dark. Does, do you feel that there's a kind of narrative here? Narrative between uh, what going on as a result of the speed of movement. Exactly. And the body and the body's adjustment to that. Um, well, yes, I, I do personally think there is one. And in fact, uh, in this second time round since 2003, when I started again with these, I, I began to see that there was um, there was uh, there was something corporeal about the movements and the intimacy and the darkness, and um, have acted as if I believed for the time being that these works could begin to describe the body, mm -hmm. and I'll come to this again when we look at a film called Breath. But okay. I mean, just to give you an idea, I began to exp whereas in the seventies my titles were all very matter of fact like line describing a cone or four long film for four projectors. Um, this time around, they began to uh, be more, um, more narrative, I should say. So we have between you and I, you and I horizontal, breath, meet, meeting you halfway, face to face, coupling, all words that are suggestive of, um, of the body or perhaps more accurately suggestive of exchanges that take place between two bodies just to finish on uh, you and I horizontal. So this is uh, this was at Pioneer Works in Brooklyn uh, in 2018. It was uh, um, unusually well attended. And, but what this shows clearly is a whole um, group of individual visitors actually, um, with their backs to the screen. You can see the lines we've already looked at on the wall. Um, I'd point out that um, there are moments where you can see that the lines are settling on people and they get fractured and you have a number of people and you begin to break up all the, the line drawing on the wall and you only have the volumetric form. This, by the way, is the other end of the image we began with, with a single man looking into space. Um, I, have, I have to say, Anthony, I was taken aback. Um, this was one of the first times um, I, I went to see this. Mm. and. Um, yeah. It was one of the first times that I saw someone taking a photograph. I'm, I'm reminded of this because I see the gentleman at the, the front of the, the image doing that, taking a photograph inside the installation. I felt like it interfered and I, I didn't know what to do with it. But then I thought, well, you know, this is this is the way that people experience these things now. Um, whereas I, I wonder if you anticipated that. 
No. I mean, my first reaction was to uh, definitely feel that it was an intrusion on the basis that the uh, screens of any smartphone were brighter than the membranes of light being projected. Oh. And therefore I felt it was very disruptive. Um, but then um, I noted also the same people armed with smartphones were staying for an hour or two hours in the installation. They were doing many different things during that time. Um, and so I realized that I should have to slightly rethink this. Um, I'm still a little ambivalent, but I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to accept it as something that's absolutely part of contemporary life. And, and um, I'm not sure I'm the sort of artist that will do climate control, you know, in a serious <laughs> way for their work. This is an animation taken at Hamburger Bahnhof of you and I horizontal also. It just shows that there are two aspects to this work. One is um, a volumetric, more or less conical cone of light, and then the other is the drawing on the wall. And that, so as a result, the form tends to go between two walls very tightly, so they occupy an entire space. And the next, a few years later, I was working on this work face to face. And I was beginning to question whether or not that was a good thing to have be so locked in to that old cinema model of the projector at the back in a projection booth and the screen at the other end and people in between. Um, I was much more comfortable with a more installation, exploration kind of um, aesthetic. And so for this one, I did some things I hadn't done before. I introduced screens. So here's one, it's a, tra it's a translucent screen, so readable from two sides. Here's a second screen, uh, also readable from two sides. The two projectors are facing opposite directions. One's on the, they're both on the floor. This one is over here and the other is way over that side. Um, and this model, paper model I made at the time when I was working out the installation shows how the, the projectors and their beams. I've represented the projector in its beam as a sort of pyramid. They're, they're kind of nesting. And uh, in the middle of a large space, it was at Sean Kelly Gallery, that photograph. And it means that the entire installation can be circumnavigated with great ease, and you can also go in and out of the installation as you wish. And this has a happy effect of meaning that, uh, of making when the visitors inside the work, they can simultaneously, instead of looking behind them to look at the um, drawing on the wall and to in front of them to see the volumetric form coming from the projector, they can do both at once. Mm -hmm. So this person can see the, the drawing that's producing um, or su producing something similar to the volumetric form they're in. Um, and I found that a very interesting development. You know, your, <clears throat> your references to um, film production, you know, terms like wipe, the wipe or the use of the storyboard <clears throat> in an effort to, to um, you know, to organize and plan um, for an installation, that, that makes sense. But the model is interesting. The model feels very architectural. Yes, well, you, I, first of all, I do a lot of drawing. Secondly, when I'm doing installations, I spend a lot of time to, uh, drawing and using section, architectural sections. Mm -hmm. um, and I found that the three-dimensional model in the, in the end was the, absolutely the best way to be able to conceptualize something. Because once you build a model, you can move it around and make it do things you never thought of. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can walk around it you know, sitting on the table. Um, and um, so I, I made a lot of these, um, these paper models and, I, uh, and they helped me sort of over a couple of hunts when I was working on them. I, I also think that there is, a, there's a obvious reference to sculpture, which has come, uh, but um, also I think beginning, I'm beginning to think to architecture. Mm -hmm. Now I'd just like to introduce this, something that's been going all, all along since 2003, with the horizontal pieces we've looked at, which is verticality. Um, one of the happy consequences of digital projectors were that unlike film projectors, they could be put in any which way, in any, anywhere at all. So they could be put on the ceiling and made to point downwards onto the floor where I would project the, the, uh, where the footprint would land. And I like very much the fact that um, it is uh, literally a footprint. People are actually walking on it. Um, 
and and I think with these vertical pieces, we see a loosening of my connection to, of the film's connection to cinema, <coughs> and then perhaps a, <coughs> an enhancement of the connection to sculpture. And as I just said, also I think people do treat these as inhabitable tent-like spaces, and and there's an architectural reference there somewhere too. Uh, so there's a shot of um, of it physically in space on the ground. And here, this is breath, breath three, and you'll probably see what the reference is here. Again, the speed is exactly the speed of, of an installed work. I think as a visitor, you're very aware that something is changing, but it is um, it is interesting to actually see it displayed here without the experience of it, because I think that all of the senses come together when you're actually inside an installation. I'm glad you think, yes, yes, it's, um, this is a, <clears throat> the other vertical piece I wanted to show, which is uh, Between You and I. So it's a double, a double piece. It also um, uses the wipe as its method of uh, composition. <clears throat> and you'll see the footprints at the moment are right at the end of the beginning of a wipe. So the one is a complete um, ellipse and the other is a traveling wave bisected by a straight line. Um, and by taking you to this, we can actually look at this structure. These are footprint pairs of the, so the first, that's, that's the one we just saw in the photograph. Mm -hmm. And these are footprint pairs every two minutes. And if I just look at the upper row for a moment, you'll see how the white works. You start off with a, a complete uh, traveling wave and a bisected by a straight line. Then the, the ellipse begins to um, cover over that traveling wave. And every two minutes, it gets a little further till it's about halfway. And then you can see that the ellipse is going, it's doing its expansion and contraction and the traveling waves are moving uh, downwards. Uh, but at the end of 16 minutes, that um, traveling wave has been transformed into a complete ellipse. Meanwhile, the other row is doing the same thing in reverse, beginning with an ellipse and being occupied, covered over by the traveling wave until it is completely reversed. So you could say that what happens over 16 minutes is these two big vertical forms change places. Mm -hmm. You know, Anthony, you said, um, just you mentioned this at the very outset of this conversation, you said that you found yourself feeling uh, related to conceptual art. Mm -hmm. But, you know, one of the tenets I, I've always thought of, of conceptual art is less interest in the form, the resulting form. And you, you seem to have a lot of interest in the resulting form. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> um, yes, um, I plead guilty to that. Oh, good. <laughs> Absolutely. And I don't see why um, conceptual art would be, keep all the interesting forms to itself. <laughs> Actually, I had a... Um, a working relationship for a couple of years with uh, Sarah Charlesworth and Joseph Kasuth in the 70s. We worked together for a couple of years. And um, and when I was still in London, I was interested in Solar Wit and um, Mel Bochner. Um, and um, so, I, I mean, in, in many, I mean, you know, I've, I have my feet in various camps and um, so far I haven't got a nosebleed. <laughs> um, Here's, here's another image of Between You and I. Now, this time we're looking right through it to the second one. I, the point I just want to make here is to note that this is a very social process looking at these works. And so the visitor finds himself spending time negotiating the various changes that occur physically as a result of the wipe, but also negotiating the space with other people. And that I think becomes quite an important uh, feature of it. I'm coming into a home stretch here, uh, Courtney. So I just thought I would show you this last <coughs> vertical work. Well, it's actually not vertical, neither is it horizontal. 
I call this slanting. And I've begun to explore this a bit. I've made a couple of works. This is a four, four projector one, the first four projector work I've made since 1974, actually. Um, and one final point about this work is that this is a large complex enough piece that it can occupy an entire room on its own, as can any of the single or double projector works also. However, um, I find uh, if I'm invited to do an installation at a museum, for instance, I will compose a single installation out of individual, previously completed individual uh, works. So this has seven in it, for instance. Um, and this is actually the Hamburger Bahnhof in Berlin. And this is an installation view of the piece that that plan was made for mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the historic hall. Did you, you know, the Hamburger Bahnhof is a former uh, industrial site. I mean, it, it, it was a former train station that is, you know, then stripped down um, to be remade as, as flexible art space. But in many ways, that's not that different than when you moved to New York in the 70s and found yourself looking at um, former light industrial loft spaces um, that were then stripped down to be used as studios and, and residential spaces. Is yes, that's absolutely that? Sorry. Does your work lend itself to, to this kind of industrial setting? Well, I, I mean, um, artists will always take advantage of what there is. We're all opportunists. And, and um, <clears throat> you know, I was making work in a loft. <laughs> um, artist space, which we saw right at the beginning with Lime Scrummy and Co, was very typical loft gallery space. Mm -hmm. Same thing, rough floors, uh, freight elevator, um, uh, radiators, that kind of thing. And um, actually, actually, as a matter of fact, it almost it almost um, did me in because um, the it turned out when I started to show the solid light works in the late 70s at um, in a brand new Kunsthalle, for instance, or a biennial in Paris, maybe, um, I discovered to my horror that the works were completely invisible. Wow. And that was because I hadn't realized that I was working with an undeclosed medium, which was dust in the air and cigarette smoke in the air. Um, lot, old industrial spaces were full of dust. They hadn't been fixed up before artists took them over. You walked into the space, you kicked up the dust. And that was the, that was the medium which made these works visible. But once I was in a brand new Kunsthalle, uh, where the air was squeaky clean and it was, you know, it was stainless steel and plate glass. Um, all you could see was the uh, drawing on the wall. And it, that's one of the reasons that I waited before returning to this form, because now I can use a haze machine, which does, uh, makes a synthetic mist, which is extremely effective, certainly more effective than the dust and the cigarette smoke was. <laughs> I've heard you use the term um, site sensitive as opposed to site specific to describe um, your relationship to that. Is that is there a sense that that you will have to replicate each time you move to a different location um, the conditions that you previously were working under naturally? Yes, um, site sensitive because I, I I'm very yes I'm I'm very sensitive to when I'm given a space to make a show in. Uh, I spend a lot of time working with those architectural sections and thinking about how to do it. And um, the thing is that these forms uh, have fairly strict parameters. I mean, they're usually 10 meters, so 32 feet tall or 32 feet across, uh, with a base of something like um, four and a half meters or 15 feet. Um, and um, I can't, they, they, that is scaled to the body. The Vitruvian man in my work is somewhere halfway down the curve. And um, it's not that flexible. They can be 28 feet, or 20, even 27. They could be 35 feet, but they can't exceed those parameters. And so that's my starting point. And then the rest is how they are, are arranged in the space to the best, to, to, make, to make a kind of sense of a single installation. Wow. Anthony, I we have to move into questions. Yep. Because in fact, shall we, I, we, shall we, I stop? we could yes, let's stop because we have so many questions right now that I worry that we 
will we won't get to all of them. This is this has been really good, and you've generated um, a lot of dialogue here. Um, right. The first question comes from Fred Tank, who asks, "Can you describe reasons for works of short performance duration and those in which you have extended the temporal structure?" So I don't quite understand the question. The qu let me let me try to reread it. Can you describe reasons for works of short performance duration and those in which you have extended the temporal structure? Oh, OK. Short or long. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, I've made a number of short performance pieces there and, and they ended up as films and they're a minute and a half long. Um, it's just that those are performances and they had photographic, uh, you know, cinematography, as it were. Um, the uh, extended temporal structure was, as I alluded to with long film for four projects, <coughs> had to do with a, um, creating a way of, of, of expanding the, 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 um, the length of a work such that it didn't create an audience. It created a, an opportunity for individuals to come and go over the whole day. Um, and this this goes back to one of my fire pieces, the last one I made, which is quite long, called Fire Cycles, which had a 13 and a half hour cycle and is actually made just before Long Film for Four Projectors. And it's how I discovered this, the, the thought that um, uh, an extended duration was useful. You know, I had found with an earlier fire piece um, in Oxford, actually, um, under the auspices of the Oxford Art Museum, um people were coming with a an expectation that they were going to do see something rather like a firework display mm. whereas from my point of view i was making a very pared down quite minimal temporal structure uh and i saw the visitor as a kind of witness to that to a sculptural process rather than someone coming to the theater and um people got quite cross and it it it, and I realized that the problem really was one of duration. It was a durational problem. If I extend the duration, then there's no question of how it will be looked. People will come and go in clusters or in, on their own, and they will decide if they can give it five minutes or, or stay for a whole cycle. Um, and so I, I do see there is, a, for me, a, a, a strong bond between the length of something and how things are attended to. Mm. I don't know if that quite answers the question, but I think I think it does. It but it makes me also wonder because you mentioned landscape for fire. Where were the the viewers? They were they were absorbed by its by the grid. Okay. Um, I mean there were different scale works, but the um three or four of them were a grid of 36 points of fire, which is um they were that was about a 200 yard square. I see. Um, and so people really rather like the solid light works. They can come walk in and out of, and in, stay inside or they can step outside or they can circumnavigate the piece. It's in a big field after all. Um, and by the end, by the last one, the 13 and a half hour one, I had reduced the grid points down to nine, but had expanded the scale to take out a whole, take in a whole field. And at that point, uh, when visitors arrived, they just wondered. They were in. They were kind of loosely inside the structure. I have another question here from Ethan Samaha, who asked, "Could you talk about the interaction with the inwards of, or sorry, I think it's innards of the light membrane and the human curiosity with staring into the origin of the projector?" Great question. I'm not sure I can answer it. Um, let's see. Could you just read it again? Sure. Uh, Thank you, you. Could you talk about the interaction with the innards of the light membrane and the human curiosity with staring into the origin of the projector? Hmm. Um, I'm not sure if that's a mystical question or a philosophical one or a physical one, actually. Um, certainly, um, what used to happen typically with the cone films is, uh, like Line describing a cone in particular, is that uh, people would begin by being extremely skeptical. I would usually say something in those days, like say, you might want to try standing with your back to the screen. And people were very skeptical. And to begin with, of course, there's not much to be seen. And it used to take about 10 minutes. And then quite suddenly, um, 
the audience there would get into it and they would start moving around and uh, by about 15 or 20 minutes in they were quite excited and then and then by the end they were clapping you know there was a sort of emotional um there was an emotional movement upward um i think nowadays uh since they are almost all installations um people explore these pieces in all kinds of surprising ways i mean some people do actually see it in spiritual terms and others in completely material terms uh some in science fiction terms it's quite um it seems to be quite open-ended as to how it might be viewed and i hope that these remarks speak to your question but i, I i'm not confident they did <laughs> Um, I'd asked this earlier, but I, I do, I would like to know more, and, and clearly there is someone else here who wants to know more, who's asked um, if you've had any uh, training in architecture or drafting, because your, your engagement with architecture, and specifically I think with some of the basic, you know, kind of shapes and forms of mm. architecture is very mm. evident. Mm. Um, the answer is no in formal terms, not at all. <clears throat> but. Um, I, I find myself, I said I was self-taught as an artist, and I find myself drawn to, I like architectural drafting and I like thinking in three dimensions. I like building models to find out how to do things. Um, and yes, I think those are architectural ideas. Um, I'd like to say that when I was eight, I used to build, um, draw interiors and build things, but I think that would be too big a claim. <laughs> <laughs> the question uh, goes on to ask what architecture interests or inspires you and you can feel free to talk about louis Kahn if you'd like to <laughs> <laughs> well i've only just yeah that that, that uh the louis Kahn building is astonishing in its use of light that was my first reaction to it when i saw it um yes i'm 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 sort of i i follow um loosely i would say architectural discourses of one kind or another they're just very very interesting um and uh the profession of architecture is so is so interesting and uh um you know i so i follow it with pleasure but i yes i don't have any any uh formal background um patil papas asks how does collaboration have a part in your work do you work with with others or have you ever worked with others yes i <clears throat> well um, I, as far as my studio is concerned, there's myself and, and Sasha, my uh, assistant. Um, so it's very pared down, but I work uh, as and when I need uh, with various um, people like I'm right, working right now with um, uh, Adam Bach, who's a developer who helps write to the code for these, um, these uh, solid light works. I, worked, I've uh, collaborated a number of occasions with the musician and composer, David Grubbs. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, we're in the middle of working on something right now. Um, those would be my, my two main collaborators, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't hesitate to work with someone else if that was, I mean, well, for instance, I mean, I've been consulting a um, architectural lighting architect, uh, um, because I wanted to get some um, understanding of what was involved in installing a certain kind of idea outdoors. Um, and so if that were to uh, bear fruit, that would be, I would be working in, uh, with a lighting architect, I suppose. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I quite like that um, uh, aspect of practice. Wow. Kay Reese writes in response to this, the light elements of shape simulate uh, walls and structures, which to me seem very architectural. So I think there is, you know, there's, there is that feel to your work. Um, someone else here writes, asks if you write regularly and if you do write, could you talk about it a bit? You I speak, do write right? fairly regularly, um, but I not as, not as a creative writer in the sense of writing fiction. I, I, I write mostly when I write, it's about, I'm trying to articulate something about something I'm working on. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I don't think I can produce any sustained book of writing, but I'm, when I do interviews with people, they tend to turn into writing um, exercises um, mutually. You know, you t one tends to um, 
worry the pros and uh, improve it. Um, yes, but I think you know, as a writer, I'd be definitely disappointed. But I, I um, writing somehow is something I do every day, one way or another. Hmm. Have you ever taught? Um, only uh, in a hit and run sense, you know, where I could do a lecture or maybe a workshop. Mm -hmm. um, I did. I mean, I quite like that relationship. I've I've done some a little bit of mentoring and so on, but I, I quite like the teaching relationship. The only trouble is that since I had spent twenty five years out of while well, I'm not making art, that's when I made a living uh, designing and editing art books and catalogues. Um, I and when I started again, uh, there were a couple of opportunities for teaching that I might have taken except that I was very worried about the idea that I spent enough time sort of out of the studio, as it were, that I, I was reluctant to commit to, you know, two days a week or something teaching. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, that I could revisit that. It's, it's um, you know, I, I quite like that sort of talking relationship between um, students and te uh, practice. Did you think when you left um, art school, in 68, did you think that you might teach? I mean, it was, it's very typical for, for British artists to also have a, a primary teaching career alongside their practice. Um, you know, <clears throat> when I came out of art school, I had a teaching job. Um, and in those days, um, before Thatcher cut, uh, decimated the art school system, there were, you know, it was like oh, every artist made a living. You, if you lectured for two days, taught two days, you could just about scrape by. And, um, um, but I didn't leave art school with any idea I might teach. It was just, um, it seemed like uh, economically sensible at the time. And, um, uh, and I quite enjoyed doing it, but uh, now, not so sure. Wow. Um, I have a question about your interest in uh, science and theories of light. Um, particularly, this person wants to know if wave particle duality and complementary principle um, quantum theory is important to you. Um, I'm sorry to say I, 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 I hold all those in fairly complete ignorance. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know very much about the science of light. Um, <clears throat> I, and so I suppose I approach it in a very material and practical way. Interesting. And if, is it, have you ever had this kind of question before about your interest in science? Because it seems like, like one that I could imagine that people come to quite interestingly because of the use, you know, something like the conical shape and its use in light. Yes. Geometry and geometry and so on. Yeah. Yeah, I can understand that. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm interested in science in general, uh, you know, this is, um, but but I don't I don't have any special um, knowledge that I I'm able to utilize making my solid light works. Put it that way. Hmm. Fotini Sari asks if you consider light as a plane drawing material or tool, or do you exploit its immaterial slash spiritual elements um, in the same way that that one might do in literature? Complicated question. Um, <laughs> I, I think I, I would have to say that all of those, all of the above, you know, I mean, I think that they, no one of those for me is more important than another. And on the spiritual uh, side of it, uh, this does come up from time to time. And I, I think I would always say that my relationship to making things is very materialistic, very practical, you know, more like plumbing than like writing poetry. And um, Davenport once said something about writing poetry, since we're mentioning it, um, that um, it was um, that sensitivity was a very good quality to have when you're reading poems, but not when you're writing them. And I thought that was a very interesting observation that, that you know, he's referring to the sort of plumbing side, the practical side of writing, it's quite hard work and, you know, you're, or, or making art. Um, and I, I consider uh, what somebody may find in the work and what they will bring to it to be uh, part of the work of, of, of looking, looking and talking about work. But that's not the same. My relationship to the work is a little different because I'm just making, making things. 
and I'm, I'm not um, thinking really about the effect something might have. I'm quite interested when there's a difficulty. Um, and I, wel I welcome those sort of moments because they, uh, they're going to produce, produce something that's interesting, uh, more likely than not. What, what do you describe, describe as a difficulty? Well, well, for instance, with uh, when I was talking about long film for four projectors early on in this talk, um, I think I mentioned that I had no idea how to look at it when I made it. And um, it was, I simply didn't know how to look at it. And, and after all, I'd made it, I shouldn't I? Uh, but it didn't come about that way. It came about by following certain trains of thought uh, and following them quite a long way and then turning that into structure. And um, if I had worried about whether it was difficult to look at, I wouldn't have made it, presumably, you know. Um, and the interesting thing about that particular difficulty, which had to do with dealing with all these fast moving things all around with no focus. Um, the interesting thing about that is that um, nowadays that isn't a difficulty. That difficulty has vanished. Um, and I noticed this first in about 2004, was showing long film for four projectors at Pompidou. And uh, there was, it was the night of the uh, Nuit Blanche, so it was open all night. Mm -hmm. And there were, <clears throat> there were people in that installation, mostly 20 and 30 somethings, who were hanging out. They were basically settling down to hang out inside the installation. And I said to a curator friend, I just don't understand it. They seem to be enjoying themselves. And I, you know, I said, I find this piece very hard to figure out how to watch. He said, yeah, but they grew up with, they grew up with raves. Yeah. And that was 2004. And now a uh, big surprise at Pioneer Works, there were 1200 people a day and they were all around 30, 25 or 30. Um, some, so of us that, were, some of us hmm? were not 25 or 30. There were, there were a few of us who were not. Oh, no, absolutely. But I would say that 70% of their demographic, let's yeah. say. Um, so, you know, these things keep changing, I think. So they're well beyond comfort level. They were basically living there for a while, you know, these people. So um, I think um, if one gets too worried about the effect of something, then, then, then you're going to lose a lot, I think. Absolutely. Another question here um, says, when I visited the show at the Albright Knox last year, I was curious about the use of digital white from the projectors and the slight color shifts at the edges of the drawings on the walls and the screens. Is the color intentional or is it just the projection data displaying the white light? Hoo -hoo. That's a good one. That's a technical question. Um, could you just reread the first the first bit? Um, so they'd seen the show at the Albright Knox yeah, last yeah. year, and they were curious about the use of digital white from the projectors and the slight color shifts at the edges of the drawings on the walls and on the screens. Is this color intentional or is it just the projection data displacing, or sorry, displaying the white light? I think it's probably just an artifact. I, I mean, I must confess, I'm not quite sure what the definition of white light is, white di digital white. I know what digital black is. I okay. guess it's just bright white. Um, I don't really know the answer to the question, actually. And as for the drawings on the wall, I don't remember them having color on their edges. Um, and they were produced by many means. Some were drawings done by in a pencil, some were um, some were uh, pigment prints, some were you know, many different methods of reproduction. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say I can't answer the question, I don't think. You know, this another question sort of gets to a similar kind of point, but from a different direction. This question says, or more of a statement, um, to control or guide light in making art must be notoriously difficult as, as it is such an elusive and fluent element. Is it difficult, um, the projections that you're making? Is it hard to get them to go in the right directions, even if you are working with the models? I don't think that's a technology question. I think it's just a question about making art, you know, uh, which is, yes, there are moments of great difficulty and confusion and uncertainty, and then there are moments when you're speeding along. Um, 
and um, technical help I can get and I'm glad to have. Um, but in the end, it's, uh, well, you know, I enjoy making art, so that gets you a long way. <laughs> Um, you have a few questions that I'm going to group together because they're about sound. Um, someone asked if you've ever worked with a musician before. Another person asked, what are your thoughts about incorporating sound? Um, and I, you know, just in all uh, transparency here, you've done a, a good deal of sound work, um, particularly you had a project here not that long ago. Do you want to talk about it? Yes, be happy to. Um, First of all, I, I decided for this talk, since it was relatively short, that I should focus on one aspect of my work, which is the solid light works, which is a, a main central activity for me. But there are others, and um, indeed sound is one of them. Um, uh, the installation that Courtney is referring to was at the Yale um, 32 Edgeware Gallery. Yale University 32 Edgeware Gallery a couple of years, three years ago, I think, um, when I showed a piece that had been lost for the last previous 30 years, which I made in 1972, called Traveling Wave, which took the form of five speakers in a line uh, through which uh, traveled um, quite violent waves, uh, unmistakably uh, sea waves, you know, wave-like sound which crashed down repeatedly at the end of the gallery over and over again. Um, and um, I think I've sort of returned to a, a more active interest in sound since then. Um, David Grubbs and I are working on a piece right now, which is uh, a new vertical, um, new vertical uh, solid light piece, but this time with, with, with an acoustic element built in or a starting, a starting place for the work. Um, in fact, the, 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 the newest work, there's a group of four works I'm working on that all involve an acoustic element. But I'm, it's a little too early for me to talk about and describe them, except to say that it's an acoustic element that sets the ball rolling and becomes central. Um, and that I'm quite interested in the way that you can convert a completely abstract installation into something quite um, in the world by the use of sound. So, um, for instance, if you if you had well, no, I, I think I don't want to do it. For instance, because I'm sort of in the middle of this, and I, I I'm superstitious about um, unraveling it before I've raveled it. <laughs> but um, but but suffice to say to your the questions um, that I am um, actively interested right now in in newly exploring some sound ideas. And that there are, in fact, a couple of works in, uh, like, um, there's a solid light work I made using sound called um, Leaving with Two Minutes Silence. And the reason I introduced the soundtrack into that is because I needed a silence in the middle of the work. And the only way to create a silence is to first put a sound there that you can then remove. Um, so uh, uh, that was, that was um, 2010, I think, I made that. Oh. So it's been floating around. The general answers to the questions are that it's it's floating through everything I do. It's just that I, um, I'm only just sort of reactivating it now. Anthony, I look forward to seeing that project. Um, and I have to say, I'm so pleased that you were able to join us here tonight for this program. Um, some of you will know that Anthony, when we reopened on September 25th, Anthony was the first uh, person to cross through the doors when we reopened. Um, Anthony, I hope you will come back when we reopen again uh, hmm. later this fall. Thank you so much um, for being here with us tonight. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, I also want to extend special thanks to Catherine Chabla, the Senior Curatorial Assistant in the Department of Rare Books and Manuscripts here at the Center, and to Jane Nawitsako, the Center's Head of Public Programs, who have helped put together this presentation uh, tonight. I hope that you will also join us again on Friday, November 20th at uh, 12 p.m. for a conversation with Nita Madahar and Chicha Ramalingam, the Center's Associate Curator of Photography. Um, thank you all and have a good night. Bye-bye.